Good morning, Arad. Now, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. You are CEO of APTA Mine and Chair of Advisory Board of a Red Sea Project. Thank you for joining us for this uh, leadership series focused on biodiversity and tourism hosted by the World Tourism Forum Lucerne and World Travel Market London. Sean, it's my pleasure entirely. Uh, always happy to support any endeavor of World Tourism Forum Lucerne and WTM London, especially one which I think is fundamental to human life on Earth. So we're talking today about biodiversity and tourism. And for many years, we've had the buzzwords, ecotourism, sustainable tourism, responsible tourism. But as we realize we've got to build back better after the COVID-19 pandemic, we're also starting to talk about regenerative tourism as a concept that makes us a nature positive sector. Can you give us your perspectives from where you engage on, on how this concept is evolving and, and how tourism can support biodiversity? Uh, you know, Sean, I think awareness and acceptance that something is wrong is often a good start to improving. The fact is, unfortunately, in our sector thus far, the best practices for sustainable development have aimed to minimize uh, the damage we cause, especially to the environment. In some instances, it has worked, but in many instances, these have fallen short, and that's despite the good intentions. And here's the thing, Sean, when you send your kids off to school, do you tell them, go be less bad today, or do you tell them, go be good today? And that is the difference. So if pre-COVID, the peak of our aspiration was let's try to be eco-friendly and sustainable, uh, where we try and mitigate the damages. Post-COVID, the aspiration has shifted. And the new frontier is saying, you know, you know what, it's not good enough to be just sustainable, because that's saying, let's not mess things up. We need to take it one notch higher and say, how do we leave a place better than we found it? It's not new, this challenge, you know. We've had this problem for decades. But I think it's about time that we now answer nature's SOS, so to speak. And I'm very optimistic because we still have the chance to put things right. Because one of the things we learned during the crisis is nature has a very powerful way of regenerating if we allow it an intense pause. Of course, intention is not enough by itself. We also need good solutions not less bad solutions, we need good solutions. So that means from the outset, what the scientists tell us, urgent action to be taken, should be integrated in our business models. We should integrate biodiversity in our planning, in our technology, in how we engage consumers, and, and the model's different. So can you tell us how in the Red Sea project this is brought to life? Now, I am completely biased uh, because I chair the advisory board, but really the Red Sea project is clearly not only one of the most ambitious tourism projects in the world, but more importantly, I think slowly but surely, it is building a proof of concept for the world that we, we cannot just halt and prevent loss of nature by creating a destination, but we can make a leap and transition into adding value through development. In tourism, at this point in time, I can't think of another project doing anything at the scale as the Red Sea project. The reason I say this is, uh, look, willingness is one thing. We still need the science. We need the funding, the technology, um, and the government will and support to make things happen. And at the Red Sea project, it is along the entire value chain. I'm talking from conception to design, planning, construction, and eventually in operation when the first phase of the project will be completed by end of 2022. What the Red Sea project is trying is um, aiming to have a 30% net positive conservation in the next two decades. Now, this is being done by a long string of actions like restoring and expanding degraded reefs, build, building tourism-focused mangroves, um, establishing seagrass meadows, extensive nurseries, which will grow 15 million plants needed for the destination, as well as something which is very exciting, which is new research to build thermally resilient coral reefs. Now, that's just the first part. The second part is ensuring that 
all human activities, even outside the conservation area, is 100% sustainable. This includes a strict approach to carrying capacity, zoning framework, a zero waste to landfill, a complete ban on um, single-use plastic, um, uh, sustainable uh, food production, uh, carbon sequestering for everything that comes and leaves the destination. I guess, in other words, what I'm saying, the project is not just aiming to minimize the impact or even conserve or preserve, it will enhance the environment. It will increase biodiversity and increase the reasons visitors would want to come to the destination and pay for the privilege of it all. So, so two questions that I would like to ask you. But one is, how does a tourist become part of a solution? Because ultimately we can have best laid plans, but in many coral reef destinations, tourists are ones that are destroying the, the asset. Um, how do you, how you make them part of this journey? And, and secondly, maybe related to that is for a coastal marine ecosystem, what innovative are you doing that you would say nobody else in the world is doing this? So I'll start with the second question uh, and then move on to your first. Um, and you're absolutely right, because traditionally, coastal development and marine conservation have always been at loggerheads. Um, in this case, at the Red Sea, by embracing conservation as a primary goal and from the outset, the project has successfully reconciled the two uh, in a way that the positive conservation outcome of 30% shown is actually going to be higher than if we were designating the entire lagoon as a marine protected area, i.e. leaving it alone. So um, the entire master planning of the Red Sea project was informed uh, based on a highly detailed marine spatial planning exercise, which had the participation of foremost scientists in the world, uh, Dr. Duarte, Dr. Brainard, um, along with John Pagano, who's a CEO, and many executives uh, along the different layers of the Red Sea Company. Now, um, it sounds easy, but when you have a development that spans 28,500 square kilometers of pristine land and water, uh, when you have site which encompasses an archipelago of 90 islands, and that has to be built around canyons, ancient heritage sites, uh, important conservation areas, the scale is suddenly you know, very daunting altogether. Most importantly, the lagoon in question features valuable habitats, including coral reefs, seagrass, mangroves, and, and it's home to species of um, uh, many of them which have glo global conservation significance, like um, uh, sea turtles and seabirds. Now, I'm talking a very painstaking exercise with multiple conservation scenarios and three layer uh, conservation zoning model. Uh, the resulting conservation to development ratio at the Red Sea is 10 is to 1. This is unprecedented in any documented coastal development. And that is what I mean by a new global standard in sustainable development. Now, it's not just obviously um, uh, in, in the planning, construction is a very good example, because one of the ways the impact of the build is being minimized is by doing bulk of the construction off site. We've always had modular construction. Uh, we've seen bathroom units and probably cabins and uh, uh, cruise liners being stacked, but never of the scale for ultra luxury over and underwater villas. Now think about it, the implication is huge. You will probably end up with less than half the number of people on the island than normal. You avoid making it look like a dreadful construction site full of materials and equipment. And when you add a layer on top where you're sourcing deliberately green materials and also looking at the carbon content of the materials used, the efforts are truly, truly admirable. Now, I go back to your question of visitors um, at the Red Sea Project, I think, um, uh, and this is, I think, very important, the number of people visiting the islands will be limited. Now, you might say that because this is an ultra luxury segment, that's fantastic because the visitors resonate that philosophy and are actually happy for the exclusivity um, and are willing to pay the premium for it. But I think more importantly, luxury tourism is about experiences and authenticity. You don't want to create another fantasy island. You don't want to visit another fantasy island. You want a place that embraces the natural environment and has a genuine sense of place with authentic culture and heritage. And I think, um, again, from a people perspective, as individuals, we need to accept that we all as individuals have a role to play because how and where you travel is 
pretty much a vote of your values. And we are all dependent on the health of the nature, culture, and history of the places we visit. So we talk a lot about stakeholder capitalism. We talk about internalizing the cost of, of externalities. Accountability is where it, where it ends. We have a measure and report. So I want to ask you, um, if we're accountable to, to our stakeholders, uh, we will have to move away from only economic reporting to also social and environmental reporting. Whether it's related to Red Sea or more generally for our sector in travel and tourism, how do you see this evolving? I love this question, Sean, because I, this is something that I genuinely believe in. I think, Sean, we need to change our metrics. Success can't be solely measured in economic terms, but all too often, what do we hear? We hear the economic lexicon of how many millions of visitors did you attract? How many billions of international receipts did you generate? But really, I think we need a more holistic measure that gives just as much importance to natural capital and social capital. And in that same vein, we need a paradigm shift because our primary objective can't just be about growing the numbers. It needs to be about creating an authentic destination where the local community is engaged as active participants and co-creators. I mean, don't get me wrong, we're doing a lot of good things as an industry. Uh, the single-use plastic is a good example, but really that is not enough. We need bigger, bolder, and more sustained efforts. We need leadership from the private sector. We need regulatory pressure. We need a financial system that incentivizes sustainability over biodiversity loss. Then we will see change. And hopefully, as we see massive stimulus going into economies in a post-COVID world, we will see that the uh, metrics integrated so that it's not just economic stimulus, but economic stimulus with a purpose that is good for the environment, good for communities. And, and good for overall society. Thank you very much for your time today. Much appreciated, Aratna. Always a pleasure, Sean. Thank you for having me.